Okay, so uh, let us continue uh, from where we uh, had stopped last time. Uh, we were describing the uh, Fourier transformation and specifically we were looking at the Fourier transformation as uh, projecting uh, any time domain uh, signal in case of continuous time or time domain sequence in, con in case of discrete time. Uh, we are projecting it on this complex exponential phasor which is rotating at a certain frequency f and that is why the f output of that uh, dot product is a function of f. If you change this small f, the frequency f, then um, this vector changes, this complex exponential vector changes and so now um, you will get, you will quite possibly get a different projection uh, and a different value of this h of f. Uh, in the discrete time this uh, is simply the dot product as it is indicated here. This little circle represents the dot product of vector h with conjugate of e of f. And when you go to the continuous time, uh, the dot product gets replaced by this integral. And this complex conjugation operation is the reason why there is a minus sign here in front of uh, this exponent. Uh, so now uh, a few remarks. One is that uh, this Fourier transform is closely related to the Laplace transform, uh, which you may have studied earlier. Uh, you may remember that the equation for the Laplace transform is uh, given like this. Uh, it's a function of uh, this variable s, uh, as it is shown here. Uh, whereas, in case of Fourier transformation, uh, this s, which has a general representation as sigma plus j times 2 pi f uh, is replaced by just 2 pi f. Basically, the sigma becomes 0. Uh, and so that shows that the Fourier transform is nothing but the Laplace transform evaluated along the imaginary axis of the s-plane. Remember, s-plane has a real axis given by sigma, imaginary axis given by this 2 pi f. And so we are evaluating the Fourier transform along only the imaginary axis of the S-plane. The Laplace transform evaluated along the imaginary axis of the S-plane, which is the frequency axis, is nothing but the Fourier transform. That you can see from the similarity of this equation with this equation. Now, uh, in general, you want to think about the Fourier transform as an analysis operation. You are given certain time domain signal, let us say h of t in this case, and you are analyzing it. Uh, in that analysis operation uh, is such that you are trying to figure out how much of h t uh, or how much of this complex exponential at frequency f is contained in h t. And that answer is h of f capital H of f. So it's a analysis operation. You analyze the CT sequence, continuous time sequence x of t, and you figure out what is the strength at which certain frequency f is present in that uh, signal. And obviously, you would change this f possibly all the way from minus infinity to positive infinity. And for different values of f, you will get a different value of h of f. Uh, and that, that value will tell you uh, how much of that particular frequency is present in the continuous time sequence, or sorry, signal x of t. Uh, essentially, you are, instead of looking at h of t, which tells you at a specific time instant t, what is the strength of the signal? That, that strength, uh, the voltage value of the signal at a particular time value t is given by the small h of t. So small h of t gives you the time domain view of the signal. Capital H of f is essentially the same thing. 
except you are now looking at the signal in the frequency domain it tells you how much of the signal is present at frequency f what is the voltage level at frequency f present in the signal so the way to think about fourier transformation is almost as if you are changing your viewpoint of looking at this particular signal from time domain to frequency domain its signal remains the same it is how you are looking at it that changes uh, in one case it is h of t gives you the time domain information of the signal whereas this capital h of f which is the fourier transformation gives you the frequency domain information okay um now so fine you change the viewpoint from time domain to frequency domain and so you got uh, from small h of t to capital h of f now what if you want to recover back or get back to the time domain uh, representation from frequency domain viewpoint so maybe you have capital h of f now with you and you want to get back to small h of t the answer is that just like there is a inverse laplace transform you would do inverse fourier transform and that formula is given as small h of t is capital h of f e to the power j 2 pi f t df but this is nothing but our synthesis operation that we have seen earlier remember this is the one that we started out with a uh, few slides back uh so let us see uh so you may recall that this is our synthesis viewpoint and then we said that uh it is this synthesis viewpoint of the time domain signal if we convert it into continuous time then we get this expression here but this expression is same as our inverse fourier transform expression so that is why the inverse fourier transform is something that we have already seen uh, just a uh, previous slide or the slide before that here our viewpoint goes back to the time domain from the frequency domain so the fourier transformation which is given by this equation is called the analysis operation it tells you given the time domain signal what is the component of a particular frequency f whereas this this equation at the bottom the inverse fourier transform gives you uh the time domain signal back and then and, and it is called the synthesis operation because now given the information about what are what is this h of f for different values of f you are able to reconstruct h of t okay um now we will take one step forward and summarize what we have studied in the previous uh, videos which is that uh, we have taken the continuous time signal x of t uh, as uh, the inverse fourier transform of capital x of f uh, and remember we have seen that Uh, this y of n which can be written like this in continuous time it generalizes to this um, by the way this here is equation a which was uh, provided few slides back and this is exactly same as equation b which was also provided earlier so if you uh, want to refresh your memory just go back and look at uh, those equations that we had uh, worked on in the previous video but now let us consider that here this y of t which is in equation b written like this 
given our definition of inverse Fourier transform, it can also be written as y of f times e to the power j to pi f t integrated over frequency variable f. And so now when you compare this equation here with this, the conclusion is that y of f is same as product of h of f and x of f. And so that gives us a final summary that given a particular system h of t with a particular input x of t in the time domain, the output that you get y of t is the convolution of x of t and h of t. This is the type of system that we are considering where the output is the convolution of the input with the system impulse response h of t. I mean obviously this is not the only type of system that one can think of. There are many many other types of systems uh, and by systems generally what is meant is uh, a general function, uh, a, a certain type of device which takes certain input and produces certain output. And so there are many ways to consider um, designing such devices. But for our present purpose, remember we, we have started out this topic by looking at the, uh, the process of convolution of two signals or two sequences. And so here, um, specifically because we are considering the convolution operation, the system actually does the convolution part and therefore we have this convolution operation indicated here. This uh, derivation that we, we just now completed shows to us that this convolution in time domain is same as multiplication in frequency domain. Because if I take the Fourier transform of the input if I take Fourier transform of the system vector or system impulse response and if I take the Fourier transform of the output, this becomes the relationship. So you see the star here which represents convolution got replaced by the simple multiplication. So if we change our viewpoint from the time domain, and if we look at the entire operation from a frequency domain perspective, then that convolution simplifies to just the standard multiplication which we are familiar with. This convolution is somewhat new to us, but this multiplication is something that we have been working with since maybe our elementary uh, grades. Okay, so this is quite uh, quite an interesting observation that th there is uh, th th there is a time domain viewpoint and a frequency domain viewpoint, and the way you go back and forth between these two viewpoints is by this transformation, and th that is why it is called transformation. The Fourier transformation, the word transform comes because you are transforming your viewpoint. You are going from one domain to the other, and from that domain you are going back to the original domain. And when you transform your viewpoint like that, something quite interesting happens. Uh, the interplay between two signals that in one domain was based on the convolution operation turns out to be just standard multiplication in the transform domain. Okay, so uh, let us summarize uh, what we have discussed so far that in the discrete time if you have two sequences x of n and h of n the convolution operation is written like this uh, and this in continuous time uh, becomes uh, the formula which is uh, which is shown over here and uh, we have seen that uh, the convolution in time domain is same as uh, multiplication in frequency domain and so because of that uh, for the discrete time uh, this y of n is given like this whereas for the continuous time y of t is given like this basically 
we are multiplying the Fourier transform of x of f, of f and h of f and then we are taking the inverse Fourier transform of the product. Now remember we had used the terminology square root raised cosine filter earlier. Um, you go back and look at those slides. Uh, based on what we have done here on this slide, you should be able to see why the word square root uh, was prefixed in front of raised cosine. Remember, we had looked at two different filters. One was just the standard raised cosine, just raised cosine basically. The other was square root raised cosine. In that time, we had made a note that why the terminology square root is needed, that we will be able to understand later on. And this should give you that, uh, I mean, the, the formulation on this slide should allow you to see to yourself to show to yourself why the square root terminology is needed. So I, I would say that take that as homework and, and basically if you, if you understood the math here, th then you will be able to kind of convince yourself that the square root terminology is needed in front of the raised cosine in the uh, discussion that we had earlier. Okay, uh, the other thing is that for the discrete time case, uh, we have used a limit of minus 0.5 to 0.5 only instead of minus infinity to infinity uh, limits that we have used for continuous time. So why is this the case? Uh, so this again we will see in a subsequent lecture. Okay, so we will stop here and then uh, the next video will continue from this slide onward.